are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Bob Littman, pre President of the City Club's Board of Directors. We're here at the Con Huntington Convention Center of Cleveland for the 2018 State of the County Address. I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Cuyahoga County Executive Armin Budish. Mr. Budish is in his fourth year of service as the second executive of a county that spans 460 square miles, is comprised of 59 communities, and has a population of more than 1.2 million people. He has committed himself to improving the life of county residents and declared his administration's top priorities are jobs, jobs, and jobs, and making the region a hub for innovation and entrepreneurship. In pursuing these priorities, Mr. Budish is committed to think big, use technology, be bold, and take some responsible risks. As we've noted in past introductions of Mr. Budish, he earned his undergraduate degree from Swarthmore College and his law degree from New York University School of Law. He founded the law firm Budish, Solomon, Steiner, and Peck and developed a national reputation for his work in consumer law, estate planning, and elder law. Mr. Budish had already established himself as a distinguished public servant before assuming his current duties having served four terms in the Ohio House of Representatives, including a term as Speaker of the House and two terms as Minority Leader. At the moment, he is unimposed in his bid for re-election in November. As Mr. Budish completes his final year of his first term, the county can note several successes. The Global Center for Health Innovation has landed high-profile tenants, increasing the region's reputation as a hub of entrepreneurship and technology. After months of tense debate, a deal to renovate Quicken Loans Arena was reached and construction has begun. And just last week, the county announced construction of one of the largest solar arrays installed in the state, which will provide clean energy for decades. Along with those successes, challenges remain. Though the county has led initiatives to combat the opiate crisis, um, the overdose rates continue to climb. In 2017, the county recorded the highest overdose death rate ever. The administration also faces inquiries on a few issues, including employee compensation, vendor relationships, and the implementation of a $25 million project that will connect all county computer and information technology systems. Today, Mr. Budish will expand on his administration's accomplishments, as well as the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead during the first part of the forum, which will be followed by our traditional city club question and answer period. Ladies and gentlemen, members, and friends of the city club, please welcome County Executive Armin Budish. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank the City Club for hosting this, which is my fourth State of the County, and I want to thank Bob for taking half my speech. Um, it is uh, great to see so many people here today, uh, people who are here because they obviously care deeply about our county, people who care very deeply about our community. They're here because they care so much about their fellow citizens. Clearly, that's why they decided to give up time to come in and join us today. Thank you all very much. President Abraham Lincoln began the Gettysburg Address with these famous words. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Well, we don't have the history of four score. It was just over seven years ago that our fathers and mothers brought forth on this county a new government. 
the primary goals were twofold. First, to strengthen our institutions against breaches of the public trust. And second, to put our region in a strong position to compete both nationally and globally for jobs and prosperity while retaining our local focus on social services. This new government is a work in progress. We are not perfect. We're learning and improving as we go. But this new dual mission is working to propel our county forward and to transform people's lives. I'll start with the first goal, to prevent and, if necessary, to punish breaches of the public trust. We, with County Council, have proactively set the highest possible ethical standards, and we're teaching and enforcing and embracing those standards throughout the county government. The Charter created a number of new safeguards, a County Council, an internal auditor, and an inspector general. It maintained an independent prosecutor, and the media is doing its job by monitoring everything we do and believe me, it's everything we do. As most of you know, several members of my administration are under investigation. This is, this is upsetting. It's upsetting for all of us who lived through the previous scandals. And it's upsetting for those of us who are working at the county striving to do great work for our residents. I've said this before, but, but it bears repeating. We are co cooperating completely, completely with the investigation. We do not yet have the results, but if there was any wrongdoing, and that's any wrongdoing, you can be absolutely assured that we will not tolerate any bad behavior on the part of anyone in my administration. Our work is too important for us to be hampered by wrongdoers. The good news is that the new government's protections of the public trust are operating well. It should be noted that the investigation was triggered by the work of the Inspector General and the Internal Auditor, neither of which existed before the change of government. We're also successfully achieving our second goal, to put us in a strong position to compete for jobs and prosperity in a global economy. Here are a few statistics that we can all be very proud of. Our county unemployment rate is almost half of what it was just eight years ago. More than 30,000 new jobs have been created. It wasn't long ago that you couldn't find a crane anywhere. But in the last decade, we've seen $8 billion of investment and development in downtown and $33 billion throughout Northeast Ohio. Per capita income in Cuyahoga County is over $50,000, the highest it's ever been in the history of the county. The aggregate income for the county is more than $62 billion, the highest it's ever been. Our young adult population, age 25 to 34, is nearly 170,000, the highest it's been since the statistics started being collected in 2005. We're seventh in the country in the percentage of young workers with an advanced degree. And for some of you, maybe the most important, Condé Nast says we're the number one best beer city in the nation. <laughs> I knew that would get an applause from some of you. These statistics and many more demonstrate that the state of the county is strong. But we still have so much more that we can and we must do. We have three major challenges, three major challenges that we must continue to tackle. First is to create, attract, and grow more jobs, and to educate and train residents to fill those jobs and get on a career path to success. Second is to improve our communities, making them more livable, safe, and welcoming. And third is to improve the health and welfare of all of our residents especially those who are the most vulnerable. These are significant goals, but we are laser focused on overcoming our challenges and making Cuyahoga County the best place to live and work in the nation. So I'd, I'd like to use the remainder of this speech 
to talk about some of the ways that we're tackling our challenges and transforming people's lives. While President Lincoln made his historic Gettysburg message in just 272 words, this talk will be a little bit longer. <laughs> Let's start with jobs. Job creation, retention, attraction, and growth. When it comes to lifting people up and transforming futures, nothing is more important than a good job. It gives people the power to support their families, to put food on the table, to provide health care and education for their kids, and to get off public benefits. A good job means wealth creation, and maybe most important, a good job means dignity for our citizens. Jobs are also critical to the quality of our communities. More jobs means more tax revenues to our cities to pay for police and fire protection and to improve our roads and bridges and parks and schools. But when we talk about jobs, we're not talking about just any job with a low wage and no future. We must help our residents get on a career path with a wage that can sustain a family. That is our goal. Together with County Council, in our last two biennial budgets, we created the county's first sustainable job creation fund to promote a strong agenda of economic development. Would Council President Dan Brady, Vice President Purnell Jones, and Council Members Nan Baker, Dale Miller, Scott Tuma, Mike Gallagher, Jack Schran, Yvonne Conwell, Chantel Brown, Michael Hauser, and Sonny Simon please rise so that we can thank you for your leadership and partnership. Successful economic development relies on partnerships, and the partnership we've developed with the City of Cleveland has yielded great results. These include the IBM Explorers headquarters, the Dealer Tire headquarters, the Quicken Loans project, the Beacon, Undercar Express, SureSight Consulting, IMS Medical, Link 59, and others. All these created or retained hundreds and hundreds of jobs. So I'd like to ask Mayor Frank Jackson, Council President Kevin Kelly, and members of Cleveland City Council to rise so that we can thank you too. <laughs> the mayor's shy. <laughs> We've also built development partnerships with our other, other local communities. Take a look at the screen for just a few examples. These projects include the headquarters for a billion dollar company, two Amazon distribution centers with 3,000 new jobs, a multinational publicly traded engineering company, a growing software business in need of talented IT experts, and a new $150 million steel mill. And while there are many, many more examples, I feel Mr. Lincoln tapping me on the shoulder. Last year, our economic development efforts retained and created thousands of jobs throughout the county. That is a big deal. These are jobs for today. But to move our county forward, long term, we have to plant seeds now for future growth. A great example is the work we're doing at the Global Center for Health Innovation. When I first became county executive, I took a hard look a very long and hard look at the Global Center, one of the county's biggest investments in economic development in our history. And to tell you the truth, I wasn't happy with what I saw. There was no life, no energy, no wow factor. After meeting with many of the tenants, I was worried that they weren't getting enough benefit to warrant renewing their leases. So I got personally involved. I spent hundreds of hours speaking with dozens of key leaders pursuing our vision to move from a smart space to a smart space focused on healthcare innovation. I was able to convince, convince BioEnterprise, which has long helped bioscience innovators to grow companies to take over the management of the Global Center. And they've already begun to bring more exciting programming and businesses into that facility. And thanks to the Cleveland Clinic and Jumpstart, 
Plug and Play, the world's largest innovation platform, opened at the Global Center last month. <clears throat> this is a very big deal. It's their first satellite platform in America outside of Silicon Valley. A panel of judges reviewed hundreds of applications from healthcare startups around the world, and they selected 12 to participate in their first Cleveland cohort. Those companies will participate in mentoring at the Global Center. Then on June 28th, they'll pitch to corporations and venture capitalists from around the world. And it's our goal to showcase Cleveland as a destination for startups to grow and create lots of jobs right here. Please take a look at this video from Plug and Play's first Cleveland Selection Day. So as the county was thinking about ways to kind of accelerate innovation, how we could leverage the capabilities and assets of the economic development ecosystem, the Global Center was a space that we thought could be a real catalyst. And here we are with the launch of Plug and Play's uh, Digital Health Accelerator. And we're looking forward to expanding the platform into internet of things and financial technology and startups, not only in Cleveland, but also startups from all over the world. If we can bring technology innovation startups here, they can operate at much less cost than they can operate in Silicon Valley. So we would love to build a model that you would have production, development, engineering here in Cleveland. Cleveland is a great place to do business in healthcare commercialization. I think a company is making a mistake if they don't think about coming to Cleveland because there's that many ingredients that are here and plug and play is just another one. Has the Global Center finally found its path forward? I'm optimistic because our biggest and most active tenant has given us a great vote of confidence. HIMSS, which is a global leader in better health through information and technology, has renewed its lease for three more years and is committed to expanding its already active programming in the center. And I want to give you one more example of an exciting new economic development project that's planting job creation seeds for the future. Please take a look at how we're starting down the path to an advanced energy economy by putting 35,000 solar panels on a Brooklyn landfill. This is a freezing cold day in the middle of winter, uh, but in six months we're going to have 35,000 solar panels producing clean energy it's going to be running into county buildings and reducing our electric bill. Brooklyn's excited to have this project. I mean, it's been a long time coming. We've been working on this project, and it's finally here. What's behind us, there's about 35,000 first solar panels. These panels were made in Toledo, Ohio. This thing will be producing a lot of energy, about 400 homes worth of power to equate how much energy will be produced. It's a Cuyahoga County project, it's a Cleveland project, and you know, we're all Ohioans here. This is one of the first projects of size to be built on a landfill. Very important to use these old brownfield sites, put them into use. The county takes this stuff seriously. We care about sustainability. We, we care about the long-term future of Cuyahoga County. We want to do this on rooftops. We want to do this in businesses. You know, we want Cuyahoga County to be the clean energy capital of Ohio and the Midwest. And we're getting a good start here, but man, we got a lot of work to do. This project will create jobs and make us a leader in the clean energy economy of the future. It'll reduce emissions, make beneficial use of a landfill, and lower energy costs for both the county and Brooklyn. This is the biggest project of its kind in Ohio. Attracting, growing, and creating more jobs is critical to fulfill our, our goal of putting people to work. But it's, it's only part of the story. To achieve transform transformational growth, 
we have to make sure we're educating and training people so that they can meet the demands of the workplace. Businesses tell us they can't find people with the right education and training for the thousands of good jobs that are open today and will be open tomorrow. That's been a major problem. How do we fix it? We must make a long-term commitment that transcends our short political cycles. If we want to truly transform our future, we have to start with our future, our children. Last year, I talked about our goal to double, double the number of kids age three or four in high-quality pre-kindergarten programs. These programs transform children's lives. I'm proud to say that our fundraising efforts enabled us to exceed our goal for this school year. We opened up 4,600 seats, up from 2,000. I'd like to give a big thank you to PNC Regional President Paul Clark and all our business and philanthropic partners for making this possible. <laughs> While we're making great progress, we still have a long way to go to guarantee every child a high-quality pre-K education. We need help. We need it from the state of Ohio. Groundwork Ohio and the Children's Hospital Association of Ohio are leading an effort to make sure that the next governor, no matter who that is, will prioritize early childhood education. You can get involved. To learn how, go to the website voteforohiokids.org. The county has also taken on a major leadership role in another initiative, the effort to make Cleveland the fourth say yes to education community in the nation. The potential is huge. If we can put it all together, and I, I believe we can, say yes will help children in Cleveland to go on to college and careers after graduating high school without regard to family income. These two programs, that's, you can applaud for that if you want. These two programs, Universal Pre-K and Say Yes, have the real potential in the long term to prepare our kids to take on the good paying jobs of the future. That is the kind of catalytic role that effective county government can play. But while we're preparing our children for tomorrow's jobs, we also need to help their parents get the skills for today's jobs. I'll highlight three specific innovative initiatives we've created this past year to get our residents on career paths to a secure future. First is skill up. We've reached out to businesses to identify openings for skilled jobs that they can't fill and to identify their good entry level employees that they already have who could fill those jobs if only they had the right training. We then partner with the business paying the incremental salary increase as they train at the company for the higher level job. And we'll pay for outside training if that's needed. Skill up is working. I'm proud to say that in less than a year, we've trained 66 workers who got average wage increases of more than 11%. Skill up is gaining national attention. It's been recognized as a best practice by the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. The big thing in our industry is the retention of our employees. Uh, the biggest thing we see is, you know, they're not always after money. It's more of training. Do you make me feel valued? Do you make me feel appreciated? So Home Instead Senior Care, along with Skill Up, has offered them the chance to grow, learn more. So all of our caregivers love this opportunity. They embrace it and they love the education. You know, they've learned a lot. And I think it's a wonderful program. And I am grateful that I was able to be a part of it, to be selected, and I'm looking forward to taking my state board test. It's been wonderful. This is our second class. The first class is uh, completed and they're ready to take their test to become certified. We'd like to run, you know, 300 people through it. You know, you hear that old adage, what if you train them and they leave your company? But it's the reverse of that is that if you don't train them and they stay, you know, it's the worst thing there. So it's like, okay. Let's take that investment and say, let's you know, make them better employees. So. We need to invest in people because when you invest in them, you keep them happy. And a happy employee 
makes a happy employer. So kudos to the county. Second is our partnership with Tri-C. Tri-C has made huge investments in equipment and programming for in-demand job training. They've agreed to accept our referrals for job training of 200 residents who are currently receiving benefits, and that training will be absolutely free. President Alec jo Alex Johnson and Tri-C, thank you very much. And third is the transformation of our summer employment program into an internship program. In the past, we'd help kids get a summer job. They got a paycheck, but when the summer ended, that was it. We're now prioritizing placement in businesses and organizations that may lead to a permanent career. From 2016 to 2017, we increased the number of youth who were offered a permanent position after the summer by 70%, and we're expecting an additional 50% increase this year. So. Okay, we're tackling head-on our first challenge of creating, attracting, and growing jobs, and educating our residents for the jobs of today and tomorrow. And if any of you have been counting my words, it's clear Abe and I parted company a long time ago. Now, on to the second major challenge, transforming our neighborhoods. Making our communities more livable, safe, and enjoyable will attract people to our region, encourage businesses to open, and boost our residents' quality of life. To accomplish this goal, we're pursuing a number of diverse approaches. Again, here are a few examples. First and foremost is our massive demolition program. The demo program is enabling our cities to eliminate blighted properties, which in turn improves the safety, attractiveness, and property values of a community. Last year alone, we spent $5.5 million, and we've allocated $21 million more for 2018 and 19. For local businesses, our storefront program gives cities the resources to improve the physical condition of their retail buildings. For residents, we partner with Key Bank, Huntington, and Third Federal to offer a number of very low-cost housing improvement programs. We support our municipalities in many crucial ways. In 2017, we awarded more than $33 million for road and bridge improvements. Under an exciting new program created by our county council, we supported a variety of community improvements that included a pavilion in Fairview Park, trees and flowers in Euclid, streetscapes in Lakewood, park improvements in Maple Heights, and a cultural center in Parma Heights. And I have to mention one other critically important community improvement, cleanup of the Arco dump site in East Cleveland. It, I will tell you, it was horrible. And then it caught fire. First call came in, is in the middle of the night. And the fire department is on the scene immediately addressing the fire. Things escalated to the level that where we got the county involvement, the state involvement. EPA was already down here, but it was a 24-hour operation for, for four straight days. The county found out about the incident, and I had reached out to the fire chief, and what we were able to do is we activated our emergency operations center, which is off-site, and we can coordinate resources for the hours ahead, and that allows them to focus on the emergency that's going on in front of them and on site. We were able to bring in over 30 fire departments, bring in a drone to help fly over and to look at where the hot spots were at, as well as public works and the sheriff's department for perimeter control and other law enforcement responsibilities. You're focusing on one thing, but there's all kinds of things happening in the background. And then you turn to the county and say, hey, this is what I need. And there they are, you know. Cleaning this up, moving the city forward, it's a transformation and a beacon of hope. 
that we can move East Cleveland forward, and we will move East Cleveland forward. I want to thank Councilman Anthony Hairston and our partners at the Cuyahoga Board of Health and the City of East Cleveland. But most important, this would not have been possible without the State of Ohio EPA. Thank you for making this happen. Our third major challenge is to improve the health and welfare of all of our residents all of our residents, with a special focus on those who are the most vulnerable. We must make sure that every person has the opportunity to live a full life. We are a caring community. We help people in need, that's who we are. In many cases, we must provide basic support, sometimes life-saving support, for children, families, seniors, and persons with disabilities. Yet, all too often, these crucial services have been difficult, if not impossible, for many residents to access. They'd have to take off work, take public transit downtown, wait in long lines. Getting help should not be that tough. Our goal to transform lives must also focus on the transformation of our own county services to make them more user-friendly. So we're changing the delivery system through an exciting partnership with the county and Cleveland libraries. Our collaboration with the libraries, it is truly an unprecedented success story. If you need medical, food, cash, or child care assistance, you can now go to the library. For basic skills or literacy education, go to the library. For a high school equivalency, Go to the library. If you want to get on a path to a career, go to the library. All this is free and available days, nights, or weekends in those, those beloved local neighborhood library buildings. And by the way, you can still get books there, too. So there are three big reasons why the public library is a natural partner with Job and Family Services. First of all, we're local. We're in communities and neighborhoods nearby. We have free parking. We're close to public transportation. We're open seven days a week, including evenings. Second, we have computers and we have an excellent internet connection. So much of the information and in the application and verification systems are online. And finally, and most importantly, we offer help. We have trained librarians. Uh, Job and Family Services came out and trained every one of our librarians on the available resources and how to connect with them, and we're eager to help and put this training to good use. So whether it's unemployment insurance, um, Medicaid, uh, housing, cash assistance, we can help get them started in the application process. They can then be referred to other services that are in the branch. For example, Aspire classes, basic skills classes, ESOL classes, GED prep classes. So for us, this is a win-win. Our residents get access to the services they need in their community to resources, partners that they already trust. We're ready to help. It's a natural fit and it's really a great use of existing resources. By coming together and by designing programs that will meet both the resident and the business needs, we will ultimately help this county thrive and we'll make more vibrant communities. I'd like to thank Siri Feldman and Felton Thomas, who are the visionary authors of these novel programs. Amy wrote those puns, by the way. <laughs> our work is crucial, particularly for children. Let's start with our very youngest. The infant mortality rate in our county is shameful. Way too many babies don't live to see their first birthday. So in 2015, we created a partnership under the name First Year Cleveland with the City of Cleveland, our hospitals, healthcare providers, philanthropic institutions, and the state of Ohio. I want especially to thank Cleveland Council President Kevin Kelly for his energetic leadership. 
efforts to attack infant mortality in the past have failed, at least in part, due to the inability to reach the people, the mothers, who most need help. So last year we added new partners, faith organizations, to help us make deep inroads into the community. Now, we've got a long way to go before declaring victory, but I can say that the infant mortality rate has declined from 2015 to 2017 from 10.5 to 7.9 deaths per 1,000 live births. That is almost a 25% decrease. That is welcome news. It's not enough, but it's certainly a move in the right direction. The county runs the foster care system. We take in children in crisis. We shelter them and work to find them forever homes, families who will adopt and raise and love them. The recent tragedy with Anaya Day Garrett, who ended up dying rather than being taken in, it's heartbreaking. It is truly, truly heartbreaking. No child in danger should fall through the cracks. That's why I've appointed an independent panel of experts to fully review this case, as well as our entire processes, and to make recommendations so that we can avoid tragedy in the future. We cannot have a single child die that should have been protected. Meanwhile, our Department of Children and Family Services is taking in many more children due to the terrible opioid crisis that's ravaging our county. The numbers are terrible. We have over 2,200 children in our care, many of whom came to us because drug addiction hit their family. Please watch this video to see how one family was able to turn tragedy into hope. Well, the kids' mom, she got addicted to heroin, got the addiction, and she couldn't let go of it. And uh, she was starting to leave the baby, the oldest baby, at home by herself. Um, so when protection services came in, they removed him from, from the home. Uh, they went to live with my cousin. She had three little ones of her own. It was just too overwhelming for her. Uh, when the baby came along, she was a drug addiction baby and it cried all night and she just said, I can't do this. So she gave me a call and she said, could you guys possibly take the kids and take care of them? I said, well, I have to check with my husband for that. And uh, when I called him, he said, absolutely. He said he will not have the children separated. They are siblings. They need to be together. So we took them and we've had them since December 2015. And the mother did pass away from a drug overdose. And uh, so now we've adopted the children. They're our babies, and they mean the world to us. So we just love them with all our heart, so. We still have over 400 children in permanent custody, wonderful kids who need a forever adoptive home. Please consider being a foster or adoptive family. Once our foster children have aged out of our system at age 18, we don't stop caring. That's why we were the original funders of a truly transformative initiative called Open Table. A young person aged out of foster care is paired with about six volunteers from the community, making up a table of regular citizens who serve, serve as life coaches. The successes for these youth are amazing. 87% have jobs, and none have become homeless. Please take a look at this video. Cuyahoga County invested two years ago in the Open Table Initiative, a group mentoring initiative. Open Table is about new friends transforming together. 
People from diverse backgrounds are coming together from all over the greater Cleveland area to serve young adults aging out of foster care. Volunteers don't need to be experts, but each takes a role. Housing, occupation, education, health care, transportation, and finances. Table members work together and they leverage who they know and what they know to increase opportunities for their young friend. And as a result, everyone around the table is transformed. I love all you guys. I'm just so grateful. And everything that you know you guys are trying to do with me is definitely we're going to keep growing together. And I know we all have learned from each other, so that's definitely going to continue to keep happening. Yeah. We love you too, Ebony. Oh, yeah, I love you all. <laughs> Open Table is a great opportunity to have a family. We say there's always room around the table, so if you want to get involved, please go to the county website to learn more. Thanks to Cleveland.com, led by Chris Quinn, the program is expanding. When Cleveland.com announced an informational meeting in February, hundreds of members of the community showed up. That's hundreds of people willing to consider giving up an hour a week for 52 weeks to help a young person who they don't even know. As a result, Open Table will double its numbers, so I'm asking County Council to double our commitment. I'd especially especially like to thank, really, the amazing Amber Donovan, who devotes endless hours to make this program a success. Amber, I know you're here. Will you please stand up so we can acknowledge your great work? <laughs> and I mentioned our partnership with the faith community. That partnership is helping us accomplish things that we've never before been able to do, not only in the area of infant mortality, but also with pre-K and with our senior citizens initiatives. So I'd like to ask members of the faith community to rise so that we can thank you too for all your help. took you a while to rise. I know how shy all of you are. A key to protecting the health and welfare of our residents is to improve the fairness and functioning of the criminal justice system. Right now, there are 49 communities operating their own jails or holding facilities. The biggest was Cleveland. We are now taking Cleveland's prisoners into county jail. This is likely to save Cleveland more than $5 million a year. And beginning in October, we will offer other cities the chance to join in our regional jail system. Now, why is this such a big deal? This can save each cash-strapped city a lot of money while allowing them to move their police onto the street. But more important, this can transform people's lives with county prisoners in a central location and working with our partners in the courts and the prosecutor. This should enable us to reduce the time for persons arrested to be assigned a lawyer, granted bail, and if possible, released pending trial. And this allows us to expand our reentry services. When combined with Judge John Russo's criminal justice initiatives, which we fully support, we may be able to truly transform the criminal justice system. So in just a few more words than the Gettysburg Address, I've tried to make vivid my vision for the essential role county, the county government plays in our residents' lives. But don't get too excited, I'm not done yet. To propel our county forward, we rely heavily on our county staff. We have an amazing workforce, people who do tremendous work at difficult and often very stressful jobs. They don't get the appreciation they deserve. So I want to take a moment now to thank them. <laughs> to accomplish our goals, we rely heavily 
on the Health and Human Services levy, which is on the ballot in just a few weeks. So here's my commercial. It's a renewal, it's not a tax increase, but it's got to pass. Everything I've talked about today and a whole lot more is dependent on that levy. If it fails, we lose $100 million a year. That is unthinkable. So please, vote for issue nine next month. At the outset, I mentioned that the new government, the new charter, set out two primary goals. Actually, there's a third, to promote voter registration and participation. The right to vote is the centerpiece of a free and open democracy. To fulfill our charter mandate, we're undertaking three new initiatives. First, we've partnered with the libraries. Whenever anyone signs onto a computer at the library, the splash page will remind people to register while providing an easy click through to the Board of Elections. And the library recently sent an email to more than 200,000 of their members with a hot link for voter registration. Second, we sent text messages to more than 60,000 county benefit recipients urging them to register and providing a link to the Elections Board. And third, we will host our second annual Youth Voting Summit to encourage high school kids who are approaching or have already reached their 18th birthday to register and to vote. Thanks to Councilman Hauser for organizing the first, first Youth Summit and for taking the lead on this one too. So we're doing a lot. In spite of our county's challenges, we have real reason to be optimistic. Not just because jobs are increasing and incomes are going up, but because our people, our community is strong, especially our kids. Our kids make me so optimistic about our future. That's because I've seen the energy, I've seen the intelligence and the courage of our children. I participated in the local march for our lives. And I have never been more inspired. Six young leaders helped organize this moving event. Grace Kelly, Jane Roach, Sam Hoag, Pranav Iyer, Kevin LaMonica, and Mila Costa. These young people represent our future. Grace and Jane are here with us today. Would you please rise so we can thank you for your inspirational leadership. You have to rise and wave so I can see where you are. Over there, okay, great, thank you. One last point. I love serving as your county executive most of the time. But I have to say, it is a tough job. It's family that helps me get through the hard times. My son Daniel is here today. Daniel, thank you. And then there's my wife of 39 years, Amy. Many of you know Amy, and you know that she writes all the bad jokes in my speeches. She's a wise counselor, and she's a strategic thinker, and she keeps me well-grounded. Amy, thank you so much. So in summary, the state of the county is strong. We are, in fact, lifting up our residents and transforming people's lives. We have the talent, we have the commitment, and I'm looking forward to working with you to continue to move our county forward. Thank you all very much. Today, we are at the Huntington Convention Center of Cleveland enjoying the 2018 State of the County Address with Cuyahoga County Executive Arvind Budish. We're about to begin our audience Q of A. If you have a question, please form a line behind the two microphones on either side of the stage. 
Questions are welcome from anyone, City Club members, guests, and those joining us by our, our broadcast or web, uh, webcast. If you'd like to tweet a question, please do it at, at the City Club. We want to remind you that the questions should be brief and to the point, and we have about 10 minutes remaining for questions. Okay. Um, We're right here. <laughs> Hello. Oh, there you are. Hi. Okay. First of all, <laughs> I want to see with the light. I want to thank you for the work that you're doing, and um, I just have to say that I think the Open Table program is one of the sweetest, most caring programs this county has ever seen. Uh, it, it allows so many people to be involved in the lives of children who need them, well, young people who need them. So I just wanted to say that. Um, my my question is: I, I sit on the state board of education, and one of the things that businesses come to us and talk about when it comes to jobs is the soft skills that so many young people do not have, um, such as just being able to show up on time, dressing according to the standards of the job, being able to communicate, teamwork, and so forth. So my question is, it's wonderful that we're going to be involving so many young people in internships uh, with all of these startup companies, but is there anyone that's going to be actually working with them on these important soft skills so that they can hold on to these internships and eventually hold on to these jobs. Absolutely, so the, thank you for your kind words, by the way, about the Open Table program. Um, when we talk about job training, we absolutely talk about the soft skills as well as the specific technical skills that people need. Um, you know, businesses, uh, again, when, when I speak to business leaders, they talk to me all the time about you know, they can't, they have trouble finding people who know to show up on time, to dress appropriately, that can pass a drug test, and they can do a resume appropriately. And those are things that we work with all the time uh, in all of our uh, work. So in our partnership with the City of Cleveland, through the WIB board, uh, we are uh, uh, constantly providing soft skill training as well as the hard skill training. In terms of our, our summer job uh, internship program, uh, we work closely with uh, the Youth Opportunities Unlimited, YOU, they're very helpful in that as well, and they connect people uh, as needed to those soft skill programs. So we are very much in agreement on that. Yes, thank you. Just want to get a uh, idea from you as where the county and what is, it, give us maybe some more information as to where you are with the reentry programs and the changes that are taking place there. You know, for for so many years, uh, you know, people go to jail, and then somehow we think that they're going to come out of jail and be full, productive members of the community when we haven't helped them, we haven't trained them to be productive members of the community. So, so we are very focused on uh, our reentry uh, work. Uh, over the last couple years, uh, we have expanded significantly our reentry programming. When we took over the Euclid Jail, we turn that into a reentry training program. We're working with the Lutheran Ministries on reentry uh, training programs. Uh, we work with uh, uh, just a host. Uh, you know, we have great programs like Edwin's in the community. The uh, creation of the of the regional jail will help us expand even further. That's what's one of the things that's so exciting. So we've now just this last week we did a ribbon cutting at the Bedford Heights Jail. Uh, we will, we've taken that over. That's been retrofitted to become a, a re-entry programming center as well as Euclid. So now Euclid will continue. Euclid has about 70 beds in it. Uh, uh, we'll continue that for women for re-entry program training. And then we're turning Bedford Heights into a male uh, re-entry program training center. And that will house about 200. So we'll significantly expand our re-entry work uh, uh, through that effort. Good afternoon, Mr. Budish. I uh, wanted to ask a question with reference to the Section 8 subsidy program. Uh, when will the uh, Housing Choice Voucher Program and self-sufficiency training be restarted in Cuyahoga County? Um, with the, uh, uh, we do a lot with both Section 8 and um, and the vouchers and the retraining programs. I mean, we, we've been involved and we continue to be involved in those programs significantly. Um, 
In fact, one of the problems that we're dealing with right now is that there are a number of landlords that won't take the vouchers or won't uh, take in people who uh, are low income uh, or have other issues. We are looking at legislation right now that will change that, that will uh, make sure that people who have vouchers uh, have those needs will be able to get housing as needed. Good afternoon. Hey, good afternoon, County Executive Budish. All right, uh, so my question is, um, in, during your speech you had talked about uh, Cleveland.com and specifically helping to raise awareness about the uh, Open Table program as well as the, the mentoring. And I was wondering, um, as I look back over the past few days, there have been announcements about uh, changes, proposed changes in local media outlets. And I'm wondering if you could kind of speak to the changes in local media and the relationship that that has on the ability for people to learn about county services and things that they may be interested in learning more about their government. Uh, well, I, I made a joke earlier about uh, the uh, media watching everything we do. Uh, and I can tell you that sometimes I complain to my wife and, and son that, you know, I wish they wouldn't keep, keep on and keep on. You know, it's, it's hard. Uh, but we need, we need a vigilant and active media. That has always been the best protection for democracy that we have in this country, and I'm very worried about where it's going. Uh, you know, we, we have... <laughs> the media is suffering, all the media, television, newspaper, online, uh, because of, in part because of the, the diffusion of all the various options people have now. It's hard to have a business plan that, that is productive. And, and I very much worry. I mean, we've seen the plain dealer scale down in the number of days of home delivery. And you know, we can't afford to lose our media in this, in this city, county, or country. And I'm especially, you might be referring to the Sinclair uh, effort to take over. Um, you know, the fact is, when, when the media becomes a political tool, and a political tool only, we lose that media, and that we lose a lot, and, and it really hurts our democracy, and, and so I'm very worried about it. I'm not sure what we can do about it, but I'm very worried about it. Yeah. Is that it? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Today at the City Club, we've been enjoying it, the 2018 State of the County ad Address with Cuyahoga County Executive Armin Budish. The presenting sponsor of today's forum is Key Bank. The supporting sponsors are Huntington Bank and Sisters of Charity Health System. Additional support is provided by Advance Ohio. Our venue partner is the Huntington Convention Center of Cleveland. We are grateful to all of you for your support. We also welcome guests from dozens of local corporations and organizations. Please check your printed program for a list of those who joined us today. We thank you all for being here and for helping to make today's forum possible. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Mr. Budish, thank you very much, and we are adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.